and have been managing DHS implementations since last few years. Um, so we are organizing this uh, level one academy for DHIS to track use uh, along with the, the team at University of Oslo, his Pindia and his Sri Lanka. Uh, as you all know, uh, the academy uh, contains the three events. Um, so we have the webinar one today and the webinar one, webinar two scheduled tomorrow. Uh, the webinar one will focus on the latest uh, DHS to track your capture features and what other features are uh, in the pipeline. So we'll be discussing that during the presentation today. Tomorrow we'll have uh, the more formal uh, introduction, the official opening, where we'll provide you with the overview of the academy, the introduction to the course instructors, and of course we'll have a round of introductions from the participants as well. We'll be introducing the uh, platforms that we'll be using for the academy for the next five days in the coming week, uh, Moodle and DHIS2. Uh, we'll have a look at the use cases that we'll be using in the academy during the course, uh, which you'll be uh, looking into evaluating. And then of course, uh, using that for all exercises and the final examination. Uh, we'll have an introduction to the community of practice also tomorrow. So we'll have the uh, COP coordinator, Gassim, who will join us and give you an overview of the COP and how uh, it can be utilized to its best potential in terms of sharing knowledge and issues and concerns related to your DHS implementations. Um, we'll introduce Slack and we'll have one hour presentation on the tracker uh, data model just to revise the concepts of the basics of tracker data model before we go into the further details of tracker use um, uh, from the first day of the academy that is Monday 26th. Uh, so, uh, so these are the main areas that we'll touch uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, I like uh, um, my fellow facilitator Pamod from Help His Sri Lanka to introduce himself and take over the webinar proceedings. Uh, Pamod, over to you. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Pamod from His Sri Lanka. So, looking forward to spending uh, roughly around one week with you uh, with this uh, DHIS2 data, uh, Tracker Data Use Academy for the uh, Asia region for year 2022. So, as uh, Saurabh has already mentioned, today we will have the first webinar, and this is about introducing the DHIS2 Tracker and the new features to you. So, let me share my screen first. Right. So in this session, we will discuss and give you an update on what DHS2 Tracker is for those of you who have been using DHS2 Tracker. And for everyone who is kind of new to the DHS2 Tracker, we will briefly mention what the DHS2 Tracker is. And then, of course, uh, we will provide you with a feature update of new features which are uh, available in the DHS2 Tracker. So I must mention that we will be using some technical words in DHIS2. Uh, uh, we, and, I mean, um, pardon us for that. Uh, for some of you, they may be slightly new, but don't worry. We will be discussing about all these features and the terminology and the data model about the tracker in the uh, upcoming days. Right. So first of all, uh, let us look at the objective of uh, today's webinar. So what we will be doing is uh, first to describe what DHIS2 Tracker is, and then we, uh, we will try to understand how DHIS2 Tracker can be modified or customized, and then describe some examples of how DHIS2 Tracker is used globally across uh, various domains. And then also we will describe the features of the DHIS2 Tracker. So we will be mostly taking examples from the health domain, such as uh, tuberculosis uh, and surveillance in explaining these various uh, scenarios today. Uh, but during the academy, you will get uh, you will get exposed to various other uh, use cases from all over the globe. And we can also further discuss of uh, uh, some use cases uh, which you are currently working in uh, while you are engaged with your uh, respective countries. Right. So first of all, what is DHIS2 Tracker? So in DHIS2, the tracker component allows for the collection analysis uh, of identifiable individual and longitudinal data. 
This means we can create unique shared records uh, which are related uh, in, in several different services to the unique record that we are tracking. So what we mean by this is, for example, uh, if we think uh, of, uh, of the health domain, we can think of a scenario where we register a person uh, in the system, in the DHS2 instance, and then we keep on uh, collecting data across various services in the lifetime of that person. So, uh, for example, in a lifetime of a person, he may be uh, he may be following services in in the immunization program, maybe tuberculosis for a program, and if it's, if, uh, if it's a female, she may be enrolled with the antenatal care program. So, all this information related to this respective program can be recorded, captured, and analyzed in the DHS2 platform at the individual level. It's not only individual level, we can further uh, move one step ahead and we can aggregate data, produce aggregate analytics based on this individual data collected in the DHS2 platform. So to do this, we have to use the DHS2 tracker component. So some of the features which are available in the DHS2 tracker include scheduling visits for various services and sending automated reminders based on these schedules and tracking missed or upcoming visits and creating reports displaying both individually identifiable and aggregated data, as I mentioned before, and support for data quality and decision support during the uh, uh, data collection and sending notifications and alerts based on data within each individual event. And in addition to collecting data, we can also analyze the data in DHS2 tracker. So while using the tracker, all the data collected at, in, at individual level is automatically aggregated based on predefined parameters. So meaning like if we collect data, supposing in an immunization program, uh, we collect data at individual level and we are able to analyze and produce analytic outputs such as tables and graphs and maps at, uh, uh, at each level of the hierarchy. So for example, if we uh, collect data at health facility level of individual patients, we are able to produce analytic outputs and dashboards at district, provincial and national level. So both individual and aggregated tracker data can be weaved and analyzed within DHS2 using the built-in analytic tools such as dashboards, tables, charts and maps. You can also export your data to analytics platform of your choice. So that means you are not kind of locked into the DHS2 platform. You can always export the data at individual level and analyze it with some external tool. Data ownership is a main uh, feature that is available with the DHS2. So DHS2 tracker contains granular sharing settings that allow system administrators to define which organizational levels, groups, and individual users can access specific kind of data stored within the tracker program. And hosting for each DHS2 instance is handled by the owner organization. So for example, the Ministry of uh, Health of a country is in charge of hosting the data. So they all have, the, the ministry will have complete ownership of the data uh, hosted in their DHS2 instance. And you can also define your own parameters for data storage in accordance with your local laws and privacy concerns. Whether uh, you host uh, your DHS2 instance locally within your country or in the cloud, uh, no outside entity, including the DHS2 software developers, can access the data unless that data is specifically granted by the owner of the database. So if you do not uh, provide access to a particular user, nobody outside of uh, uh, your organization or your information system will be able to access data uh, which is stored in your DHS2 instance because we will be, uh, while using DHS2 tracker, we will be uh, collecting and analyzing data at individual personal level. This is of a major concern and we just want to assure you that. So tracker component, just like the DHS2 aggregate, is customizable. So what do we mean by that? The information and the workflows that are defined within the tracker are completely customizable. So uh, to, to facilitate this, we have a number of standard digital packages which are available as a starting point that can be freely modified 
based on local context. So these packages, which we will be discussing a little bit more in detail in upcoming days, uh, are a collection of metadata. So in case if you, for example, if your ministry wants to set up a collection of TB uh, related data in your country and you don't want to start from the scratch and you are more interested in uh, uh, establishing an information system uh, according to the uh, globally accepted standards, what you can simply do is to set up your uh, DHS2 instance and then install this metadata package which comes uh, bundled together and once you do that you can have an uh, have a dhs2 tracker instance up and running in no time but of course you might have to customize it based on your country requirements and these configurations that we mentioned as uh, uh, digital metadata packages are based on inputs from various partners including who cdc unicef and gavi and many other partners so DHS2 Tracker is currently in use in more than 88 countries across the globe. So you can see uh, the adoption in the map on your right. And these countries and organizations which are already using DHS2 for aggregate data can leverage the existing infrastructure to implement tracker programs without the need for an additional software platform. So if your country already has a DHS2 Tracker implementation, sorry, if you if you already have a dhs2 aggregate implementation you can use the same uh, network and hosting infrastructure uh, to set up your dhs2 tracker component you won't be actually needing uh, any additional information when you are starting up but however when you scale up you might need to expand your resources based on your requirements so there are several core applications and features related to, to DHS2 Tracker and some of these uh, um, the applications which we'll be using are listed in this slide. So for data collection, we will be using capture application, tracker capture and Android capture and to produce outputs, uh, we are using charts, tables, maps and dashboards. So every release of DHS2 involves some updates to these tools. So some of you may already be familiar and may be using these tools. So let us discuss some of the main updates we have seen lately uh, in some of the tools that we have mentioned here. So first we will discuss briefly about tracker, tracker uh, sorry, uh, first we will discuss briefly about this capture application. So the DHS2 capture application uh, is used to register new tracked entity instances and enroll into programs. So tracked entity instances is again a technical term which we'll be explaining to you during the academy. So you can think of, for example, a person. So the capture application uh, helps you uh, in registering a person and enrolling into various health programs that you have already configured in your tracker. And in addition, it weaves uh, uh, the tracker dashboards and, uh, and also supports adding and updating various events. And it uh, also supports searching for tracked entity instances and listing and filtering tracked entity instances in tracker programs. So what you are seeing here uh, uh, is the uh, DHS2 capture application. And you can uh, clearly see in the screenshots uh, uh, that this application integrates uh, events and tracker data uh, in one application. So historically, uh, if you have used this application, it used to support collection of events first, not the tracker data, but now it supports both the uh, tracker and event data capture. But however, uh, in the latest version, I mean, this is a work in progress. So uh, while it is supporting tracker data collection, uh, some of the widgets that you may be uh, uh, finding in the tracker capture application, which we have been using uh, to capture DHS2 tracker data, such as the relationship and referral uh, widgets, are not uh, currently incorporated in the capture application, but they'll be included in time to come. And the capture app also supports pattern based ID generation, as you are seeing on the screenshot on your left. So here, uh, for example, in uh, generating the unique ID, we can configure it so that uh, uh, it, it, it supports generation of the ID based on uh, predefined patterns. And in addition, it also supports the uh, detection of duplicates during the registration uh, that you are seeing on your right. right. So if there is a possible uh, duplicate 
record that is found when you are entering or registering a patient, it will always prompt you. And what you are seeing here is a, is a screenshot from the tracker capture application, which you have been historically uh, using to collect DHIS2 data uh, related to the tracker, like, uh, for example, patient level data uh, of uh, patients we are following up in health programs. So the DHIS2 tracker capture application supports reviewing the tracked entity dashboards uh, and also review indicators. And in case if you want to provide feedback of uh, uh, to the to the user uh, based on the uh, data collected on that patient, it is supported. And with it, it also supports management of all the enrollments, uh, meaning like if if a patient is having enrollments in multiple health programs, uh, the tracker capture application supports that. And of course, managing um, features such as relationships and entering event data for tracked entities are supported in the DHS2 tracker capture application as seen here. And the capture application, of course, uh, supports comparing repeatable events during the data entry. So uh, you are you are actually seeing two different views. One in which you can actually see uh, the variance various events in a repeatable program stage uh, as columns. Uh, uh, what you are seeing on your left and on your right, you are actually seeing the tabular data entry feature, where uh, you will be able to see uh, all the events of a repeatable program stage in a tabular fashion. All this we'll be discussing uh, during the course of this academy. And the tracker capture application uh, also supports uh, metadata and data sharing. So what we mean by data sharing is it will control who can access uh, registration of individuals. And then, of course, you can control access to specific program stages like uh, uh, data, I mean, collecting of data related to some sections within the program. We can restrict who will have access to that uh, particular section. And then, of course, we can further control who will be able to access the data in analytics application. So you are seeing here uh, uh, some of the uh, screenshots related to this access control. So, for example, here we try to register a uh, person in a, in a, in a tracker uh, in a tracker program and for some reason if that person is not having access it will prompt you saying you don't have access to create an event uh, in the current selection so likewise we can kind of uh, compartmentalize the access within your tracker program so you can give separate user groups user roles access uh, to, a, to, to, a, to a particular section within your health uh, data collection So here also we are trying to show you uh, how we can uh, kind of uh, restrict access. So for this ANC pro, uh, registration, now in, uh, in the standard form that you are seeing here, uh, the data entry and registration is all uh, available uh, to, a, to a default user. But in case if the access is restricted, you will be seeing that uh, the fields are grayed out and you will be seeing an icon like this uh, where it, it prompts saying that you are not able to uh, edit the data. So uh, uh, restrictions uh, such as this is available and uh, fully customizable in the DHIS2 tracker. And the tracker capture application also supports uh, features such as persistent top bar while entering data. So uh, we have seen like when you are entering data on a particular patient, it, it really helps for us to see some basic information such as uh, the information we are collecting as attributes for that tracked entity or the person to be displayed at the top bar so that we can quickly reference have a look at and also clarify who uh, the which patient we are entering data especially in the context of uh, entering a large number of data uh, of related to persons for example it could be covid immunization where you really have to uh, clear uh, bulk of the patients in a very short span of time, it can come in very handy, handy to have this uh, the top bar. And in addition, another security feature which is available in the DHS2 tracker is the, uh, is the audits. So what we mean by audits is that, uh, so whenever, uh, a health, supposing in an example where a health facility user wants to access data related to a patient which has been collected by another facility. 
So this may not be a standard practice. So in case if, if a person of another health facility wants to uh, see some uh, events which have been or, or data that is captured from a different health facility, we can always configure DHS to tracker in such a way where uh, whenever they want to access, we can define uh, whether uh, we are totally blocking that and we don't kind of let that person access data outside of his facility at all or else if we want to uh, let that person access uh, whenever they do that to provide some reason before accessing the data so this is the concept called breaking the glass which we'll be uh, mentioning during the academy so uh, this kind of granular security settings are always available uh, in, the, in the DHS to tracker and uh, this keeps evolving based on the requirements across the globe. And what you are seeing here is, uh, is the audited values. So for example, we can configure the tracker where, where we keep a kind of a track of what happened to a particular data item. Uh, so in case if we want to see like who updated or made a change to a captured data and keep a log of all these uh, updates and changes, we can always do that. And what you are seeing here is this uh, feature called audit history, where we can keep track of who created a data value, who made changes, who deleted, who updated, all these can be um, uh, captured in the audit history. Right. And uh, while capturing data, there is always uh, a feature available to shift between several data entry modes, depending on program requirements and user preferences. So here, what you are seeing is uh, uh, two um, different capture uh, uh, user interfaces. So one to your left is uh, what we call the timeline data entry, where we are, we are having these uh, boxes uh, at the top, uh, where each box represents um, uh, a particular event. And on to your right, you are actually seeing uh, the feature called tabular data entry, where like uh, here you are seeing uh, the data entry interface as a table format. Uh, and we just have to click on the uh, row header uh, to, to toggle between the various events. And here again, like uh, we, we are showing another interface. So what I want to highlight here is like we have different uh, user interface to support capturing data as per your convenience. Right. So another feature which we have seen in uh, latest version of DHIS2 is the user assignments of events and custom working list management. So while capturing data, now we have the provision to assign a particular event to a particular user. So uh, what you see on the screenshot number one here is where we do this assignment. So uh, uh, in this particular example, the lab result, we are assigning to a particular user, right? So once we do that, when that particular user logs in from his account, he will be able to see a working list of the events uh, which are assigned to him. So this way, it will be much easier to manage workflows related to users. Uh, and we can have a clear and less cluttered uh, interface for the user when he logs in. And also DHS2 supports creating relationships. So this was a very handy tool, especially during the COVID-19 um, uh, surveillance, where like, uh, uh, especially in the case of like uh, contact mapping and contact tracing, uh, we had a requirement to relate one person to another, right? So this, this is what we mean by relationships. So we can create relationships in DHS2 where a particular person can be linked to another member, right? So uh, the, 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 the capture interfaces supports uh, these relationships. So we can create a relationship while we are capturing data. And the analysis uh, related to the relationship is some work in progress. And um, I'm very hopeful that you will be able to see many exciting features in analyzing and visualizing these relationships in upcoming versions of DHIS2. And the DHIS2 supports enrolling a person in multiple health programs. So here we are seeing a contact registration. So a person who is kind of registered in the case-based program, we can always register that person in contact uh, follow-up program. So here what we support is to kind of register a person in multiple health programs, 
right so this way uh, uh, when we are managing the uh, the life cycle of a patient we can at a given time have a patient in uh, enrolled in multiple uh, programs or actually in no programs at all right so this is a kind of a very handy feature so that we don't have to you know like duplicate creating or registering the same patient all over again we can pull up the records of that patient and just keep enrolling that one to a new new health program and in addition the dhs2 also supports uh, creating indicators so indicators are basically calculated values uh, and we can display them on the fly while we are capturing data so for example if we uh, collect the patient's um, um, date of birth we can always calculate the current age and display it in indicator widget while we are capturing data and of course, the DHS2 tracker supports scheduling visits and tracking their status. So for example, we can schedule an upcoming immunization visit for a patient, and we can also track uh, who is due for a particular date. And in case if there are dropouts, we can uh, easily track them because we have this schedule, uh, schedule date functionality in DHS2. In addition, DHS2 supports reminders sending reminders to health staff as well as beneficiaries or patients um, based on these scheduled visits so the notifications uh, uh, can be configured to be sent out as emails or system generated messages within the dhs platform or even uh, via sms so so sometimes when you want to send out emails and sms you might also consider using an external email server or external SMS gateway uh, to facilitate this feature uh, fully. And the DHS2 tracker capture also supports uh, some criteria for decision support and data quality while capturing data. So for example, you are, what you are seeing here is when you select a particular a vaccine type, uh, uh, and select the particular vaccine manufacturer, it supports uh, auto, auto uh, um, display of the batch number and the expiration date as well as total dose, doses required. So here we are actually trying to kind of support, uh, facilitate decision support as well as reduce the data entry er uh, error that can take, take place by automating, uh, populating some of the fields. So these kind of functionalities are available in DHS2 and these are fully customizable based on your requirements. And in addition, uh, there's also a, a, a feature available to show some feedback. So this feedback can be something such as a warning or an error where we can kind of do a real time validation of a data that is entered by the end user. So in case if we want to do a validation, uh, and, and we identify there is some uh, error in the entered data, we can definitely prompt it. And in case if we feel uh, that the data entry person should uh, check the data again, we can uh, uh, give us some kind of a warning there itself so that uh, uh, we can support, with this feature, we can definitely support uh, minimizing the data error, uh, the data entry errors that can happen during the data capture. Right, so now that we have discussed about various functionalities and features available in the web interface of DHS to capture uh, related to tracker, let us now focus on what is there uh, in the Android. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague uh, Saurabh to take it forward uh, from here. Over to you Saurabh. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Mamut. Uh, I'll just share my screen. All right. So we'll continue with the uh, the DHS to Android features. So as uh, similar to the web application and the features that we uh, discussed uh, right before, the DHS2 also supports uh, an Android application which works with all three data models, aggregate, event, and tracker data, and works both in online as well as offline uh, modes. Uh, so the app is tailored to uh, set uh, mobile data collection interfaces, both uh, work on a normal Android phone and as well as an Android tablet. 
And with these new features, which have been coming in with each release, uh, offline analytics has also been introduced, uh, where you can where you can uh, see the offline analytics within the tagged entity dashboard. So the various features uh, we'll discuss for the Android app. So uh, on the screenshots which you see here, so you can via the sharing settings of the programs which you do on the web version. Um, you can do um, you can assign these programs to the user, and the user will have the access to different uh, programs, which may be of both event as well as tracker type. And then you can also give them access to different data sets. So all the uh, metadata to which the user has access to, which can be data sets, event programs, and tracker programs, they'll be listed on the homepage of the Android application once the user logs in. Then in the event programs, we are currently supporting uh, icon set based uh, data entry, where when you're defining your drop down menus or your option sets, you can assign you can assign an image or an icon to the option, and then you'll have these pictorial uh, data collection screens can also be defined. So currently it is uh, applicable to event programs only, but moving forward, this would uh, uh, be also applied to the tracker uh, programs. <clears throat> So as we saw the, that in the web version, we had defined some uh, program rules and uh, uh, logics to apply or automatically push the application uh, data into different fields based on the previous values selected. So the same uh, uh, program rules, which are defined in the web version uh, also work seamlessly on the Android versions. However, when you're configuring these program rules, you need to ensure that uh, you put the, the available considerations into account to design programs in a way that they are compatible both on the web version and the Android version. <clears throat> Um, given that a lot of health programs work in hard to reach areas, uh, there is always a need to have uh, a digital way to collect data, which is not relying only on the internet connection. So the web version, we know that needs constant supply of internet to be operational, but wherever, when the health worker is on the field or there is a lack of internet connectivity, the health worker can switch to the Android application. Uh, where uh, a local database is maintained in the device, which is synchronized with the copy of the metadata. And as new data is added to the Android application, uh, whenever the connectivity is reached or whenever uh, it is available, the data can be pushed to the web version from the Android version. So the data remains within a device and uh, uh, depending upon a manual sync or an automated sync, which can be configured, the information can be pushed to the web server, which was collected offline using the Android device. Uh, next, similar to the web version, we also have a, a integrated search and duplicate detection uh, because we need to ensure that we're registering unique beneficiaries and not, not creating duplicate records. So here you can search for a respective uh, beneficiary uh, through uh, putting in values for different attributes. So you can put either one attribute or a combination of certain attributes, and then the app will search the, uh, the records which are available in the device and give you the matching results. In case no results are found with the search criteria, then you can proceed towards the registration of the person. In certain use cases, we uh, got the feedback from the community that the search function may not be required. Therefore, uh, now there is an option that you can define the workflow uh, while configuring the uh, your program and the Android implementation, whether you need the uh, search feature as a compulsion or you can directly move towards creating new profiles. So you can configure these settings using the Android settings app. And then these settings are applied globally to all the users who log in into the application. Um, as we saw in the web version, we have a tracked entry dashboard. Similar to web version, the Android app also supports uh, the tracked entry dashboard where you can see the vital details of the beneficiary. You can go into the uh, registration data, make some updates, and then you can see the list of all the events or all the services the beneficiary has been provided with. And uh, you can add new services, schedule new uh, events, and you can even make a referral uh, of the case to another uh, health facility, which provides similar services uh, for the programs. 
the maps uh, feature has been introduced in the Android app and it has been uh, enhanced since last two releases. So when you're registering uh, new beneficiaries or creating new events, you can collect the specific coordinates of the beneficiary and uh, also associate them to the events. Those events or the coordinates which you collect can be uh, plotted on the map, which you can see in the Android app itself. So you can see the individuals, those who have been registered uh, in the application and they have coordinates available. Uh, you can capture the location in two ways. One is capturing the exact coordinates, uh, but then you can also uh, use, uh, uh, collect the polygons from or an area from where the patient is getting registered. So both the features are available. So when you're making selections, you get both the options, whether you want to choose coordinates or you want to choose a specific polygon area. So both uh, can be done. So on maps recently, there they have been new features which have, which have been introduced specifically, uh, the use cases which came across during the COVID pandemic. So when you're using your Android application, the uh, DHS to Android app is now integrated with Google Maps. So you can uh, take the beneficiary's location from your device and you can see the current distance between your location and the beneficiary's location. If you're collecting data by specific households, then you can see uh, how far you are from the beneficiary household. And if you make you need to make home visits, then you can follow the location and reach the beneficiary based on the information which is available in the uh, Android application. So these new use cases were specifically introduced during the COVID period where the linkage between the, the beneficiary and the health facility suffered. So a lot of uh, uh, fee impetus was given in using features where we can provide continuous care at home by uh, ensuring that the user is able to uh, connect his location and the beneficiary's location using the Android application and in its integration with the Google Maps. <clears throat> Then uh, another feature is that you can uh, collect images uh, using your Android device, or you can also read QR codes or barcodes for registration and searching. So during the uh, COVID vaccination examples, we saw a lot of countries were generating these QR codes uh, for on their vaccine certificates. Uh, and uh, they they had set of information embedded so there were features introduced where you could scan a, a specific qr code and then uh, the system will search for that specific beneficiary and give access to the record without uh, the need to do a manual search by entering the specific attributes you could just scan a qr code and uh, if the qr code has the system id embedded then it will just search for that system id and give you the the record uh, there have been use cases where uh, QR codes have also been used for registration purpose. So if the country follows a master patient index and they have issued these MPI cards which have QR code support, then you could fetch the information which was embedded within the QR code into the registration form and proceed with the registration process uh, moving forward. So this was also piloted in a few countries uh, using program rules and uh, uh, it was pretty successful. So uh, with uh, the advancements which are happening uh, with use of QR codes and barcodes, uh, the app is also enhancing the support to uh, get uh, to use and support different uh, QR codes for patient information, plus the barcodes for all stock related uh, scanning, which needs to be done uh, specifically for the LMIS use cases. Uh, in terms of the user interface, uh, continuous improvements are being made. Um, there are uh, multiple rendering options now available, which includes uh, different types of uh, uh, data selection mechanisms, which could be, uh, as you see on the screen, it could be vertical radio buttons, it could be horizontal radio buttons, you can do check boxes, you can have drop downs. So if you have uh, options, uh, say around five or six options, which you don't want to show as a drop down, but you want to show it as radio buttons, then you can configure the look and feel and you can decide that in what way you want to show your specific options. Uh, but of course, there is an attached limit. If you have more than 10 options, then of course, uh, it takes a lot of real estate when you talk about horizontal vertical selection. So it will not turn the, the option set or the data element appearance as a uh, radio buttons if it exceeds a set number of options. So uh, that uh, has been already put into account. Then you <clears throat> can have these uh, 
available uh, the custom working list filters where the end user can generate working lists. So there are two levels at which this functionality has been implemented. One is you can filter the events by uh, the events which have been assigned to you. So in the web, we saw that we can assign different users to certain events. Uh, and the same can be done on the Android application. So then the user can generate the events which are assigned to him uh, for further follow-up or the events which have been assigned to anyone which has access to the program and the health facility. And then you can also filter events by different timelines. Uh, what are the events due today? What are the due events in a week? And how many events are still unsynchronized? How many are synchronized? So you can put some additional filters and create different working list filters for you to uh, use. Uh, now we have local offline analytics supported uh, in the Android app uh, as well. So you can, uh, when, when you're creating your web dashboards, you can define what charts you want to um, uh, see on the Android application and what dashboard or what group of charts you want to see, uh, which you have added on a dashboard on the Android app as well. Uh, so the the data which is populated on these charts are basically from the data which is available in the device. So whatever number of records you have collected on your device, it will take up that data and create these uh, charts for you. So the charts are at two levels. One is uh, the level of individual where you can plot these information such as uh, weight, uh, the, the vaccination status of important doses, the evaluation of height, evaluation of uh, weight. And then you can also see the comparison between weight and height and different uh, uh, Z scores which are there for uh, nutrition monitoring. So this is one example where you are plotting data for one individual and then reviewing the, eval the evolution of the data with that specific individual. Uh, but now you can also have your indicators data populated locally on your devices so you can configure your uh, uh, android offline analysis uh, on the web version and circulate with the users so we'll during the course of the academy we'll see how we can <clears throat> how we can configure our android specific analytics and and can use that in the android application as well Uh, then in terms of uh, the overall visualization tools available in DHIS2, you have your data visualizer application, which has now, uh, which has, which is a combination of charts and the pivot table function. So from version 2.37 onwards, the pivot table app has been merged with data visualizer. So all the use cases, all the features which are available in the pivot table app are now part of data visualizer. So within the visualizer, you have different chart types available where you can create a uh, single value numbers. You can create your trend lines across the years. You can, uh, you have the maps app where you can create different applications, different uh, 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 geographical analysis of data. You can create patient and event clusters uh, where you can uh, do these clusters and then you can put additional filters and do styling to see data uh, which has been entered for different events and how it can be further styled and differentiated into different uh, uh, categories of examples. So if you want to see the total number of malaria cases registered uh, by gender, so you can create these uh, uh, case clusters and then you can differentiate them by the color. So for example, in this, uh, we can see that there are two colors available. So one of them is representing the male cases out of the 1487 cases reported in the geography and the blue one is for the females. So you can create similar clusters and add more styling to the clusters that you're creating. So we'll see uh, in how you can use uh, the maps application to analyze tracker data, both uh, patient specific and also related to the indicators during the academy sessions. Um, the event reports app is currently being worked upon to be upgraded to the new line listing app. So there are a lot of new features which are under development and the, the new line listing app has been introduced uh, for beta testing uh, from version 2.38 onwards. Uh, so the event reports app has been rewritten uh, on a modern and user experience for to provide modern user experience and uh, to improve on the technical stack which was being used before. So it is the design language is in sync with the data visualizer application and it supports the tracked entity analytics where you can 
generate your line list from across the program uh, using uh, the attributes, the, the patient specific information and the data elements on different stages. And you can create your uh, line lists and even aggregate that information on the fly, depending upon your requirements. So this app is compatible from version 2.38 onwards. And uh, uh, a lot of continuous development is being done on this application to put in all the use cases and the requirements that we received for uh, a tracker line listing app from the community. So this is currently a work in progress. <clears throat> So now we'll just have a look at how we can visualize tracker data. So one is you can have a look at the patient specific information using the event reports or, or the line listing app, uh, but you can also aggregate that information in form of uh, program indicators and indicators, and you can also aggregate the patient information through event reports. So for example, you want to see the distribution of COVID doses by COVID vaccines by different doses and gender, then you can create these event reports or you can create your program indicators and then you can visualize that data using the analytics uh, application. So all the tracker data which you're collecting using events or the tracker capture apps, you can uh, aggregate that information through event reports and you can create program indicators to um, use those program indicators and indicators as part of your uh, analytics application and put them on the dashboards for further analysis. Um, so with use of uh, the standard option sets, which are defined for your different data elements, you can, since they're codified, so you can quickly uh, aggregate that information and see that information through event visualizer, or you can also use the program indicators for this. So uh, the standardized responses which you collect, which may be different age groups, you can see different uh, types of vaccines, or if you are uh, uh, looking at, uh, different case surveillance program for HIV and TB, you want to see uh, quick uh, uh, data uh, for uh, patients currently on treatment, or you want to see the outcome of TB treatment, then you can uh, easily uh, aggregate the standardized responses which you collect for the TB treatment status or HIV treatment status. So that could be easily aggregated and you can use the applications available to um, aggregate this information. <clears throat> Then we can also create indicators using both tracker and aggregate data. So many times we see that uh, for individuals, uh, in we're collecting data in tracker, but then our denominators and our uh, population estimates or our program targets are part of the aggregate data sets. So when you're creating your indicators, you can pull data from all different sources. You can pull data from uh, the program indicators, which are aggregating data from your tracker capture or event capture, or you can, uh, pull your uh, aggregate denominators or estimations from the uh, data sets in which you are storing the information, say annually or whatever is the frequency for storing your uh, estimates and targets. So you can combine when creating your indicators, you can combine data from all three sources and build your indicators. So the program indicators will give you total counts of uh, say uh, the people who have taken the first dose of COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, and then if you have age specific targets defined, then the age uh, attribute allows you to do an aggregation based on the age of the individual. And then you can create your uh, um, program indicator where you can count how many people have been given dose one and who lie between the age group 35 and 54. And then you can divide that by a specific data element which stores the target of this respective population age group. And then you can get these uh, coverages in terms of percentage. So uh, when you're using tracker, it doesn't mean that you cannot uh, combine that data with the other data sources available. So based on your requirements, you, you can define your indicators, which can pull data from multiple sources. And you can uh, view that data uh, in in same report and the same output. So in the example you see here, people receiving first dose 35 to 54, that is a program indicator and the data is coming from a tracker program. The population estimate of 35 to 54 years, that is coming from an aggregate uh, data set. And this helps us to do the total coverage where we see the dose one coverage is an indicator, which gives you the percentage of population, the eligible population who has been vaccinated for dose one. 
So you can combine these program indicators together and data elements together to have your combined analytics uh, from different data sources. Now, since you're collecting granular data using tracker events, uh, it is very easy to apply different disaggregations to the raw data. So in case you want to analyze the same data, but between different age bands, so you can create your different uh, uh, age bands using the legends and you can assign those legends to your, uh, uh, your uh, age attributes. So if you want to see the cases of say COVID-19 cases by age and sex so you can define the age bands accordingly and then you can disaggregate uh, the information uh, by different uh, legends which you can define and then you can see the data in different combinations so given that this data is granular you're collecting data for each case then it's easy for you and the system to generate these combinations and give you the data disaggregations as per the requirements. Uh, now, as we discussed, uh, you can review the tracker data across uh, multiple uh, program stages. So the event reports in the latest version, as well as the new line listing app, allows you to create tables which contain data from different program stages across the enrollment. So for me, it is important to see that uh, the, so for example, the person who was uh, uh, registered with COVID-19 or a person who was registered as a suspected TB case and then what was the, the the lab result which was taken up for that specific case and what was the overall TB treatment outcome or health outcome in terms of COVID-19. So now this data gets collected across different forms but in the output you want to have a combined table which can give you information from each of these events which are created for this respective case. So when you're creating your event reports or you, you're creating your uh, uh, tables, you can pull data from these different stages uh, and create a combined table. In terms of the if the lab, the lab if your uh, program stage is a repeatable stage, then it will take up the data from the last, the latest stage which was created so that you have the latest information for that specific patient available in your tables when you're creating those tables. So you can review the data across multiple program stages and select data elements which can belong to different stages in one table so that you have a combined overview of the case over different services which were given to that specific patient. So uh, one way is to look at the, the latest uh, data for that program stage in case of a repeatable event, but you can also see the data for all the events that the patients have taken. So for example, if I look at the, um, the vaccination data, then I want to see all the vaccination events which have been reported. So I can do an event report where I can select the, uh, the, the event and the data elements which I want to review. So I can see the set of all the events all the repeat all the events which have been given for repeatable stage uh, those also can be uh, grouped together or if i want to see uh, the data for uh, specific events uh, compiled together then I, as we saw in the previous step we can do that uh, we can combine data from different program stages and create a combined table but we can also see for a repeated stage you want to see all the events then you can do that as well so both the features are available uh, in the latest edition of the event reports and the line listing app then we come to the maps application, how it can be used for uh, visualizing the, uh, the, the tracker data. Uh, one way is you, you can use your thematic maps. So you can create your program indicators or indicators, and then you can plot those uh, program indicators and indicators on the maps app using the thematic layers where you can do these heat maps where the, the legend uh, can be defined based on the indicator requirements. But then if you're collecting individual data, then based on the coordinates of the, the patients and the events that they collect in the system, you can create these clusters where you can see uh, out of the total events registered or total patients registered uh, in the system, how many are male patients, how many are female patients. You can also do age specific clusters. You can do clusters based on, uh, for example, if you're tracking malaria cases, you are 
looking at the 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 causative organism uh, then you can look at how many cases were pv how many cases were pf so depending upon your analysis needs and how you want to create these clusters you can select your data elements put filters and then use styling on the maps app to create these uh, patient clusters or event clusters which can be uh, put on the dashboard as well and can be downloaded as images to be used for your uh, data review presentations etc uh, then during the uh, pandemic a lot of requirements came for contact tracing and then contact tracing is very frequently done for different programs uh, more or less for pb as well so there uh, the tracked entity layer and there were features introduced to use relationships in the maps application where you could identify the index case uh, as the red dot as you see here and then to how many other cases has the index case been linked to so you can create uh, you can map your relationships on the map uh, based on the individual location which has been entered and if relationships have been created with that specific case so the red dot you see here is the index case uh, for example, that was, uh, say, one of the TB cases that were identified or one of the COVID cases that was identified. And then if the person has come in contact with five other individuals and they are registered under the contact tracing program, then you can, based on the relationship which has been created, you can uh, plot the, the, the map to, so one index case is related to how many individuals and what is their location. So you can create these type of maps also in the uh, maps application. Um, then in the pandemic, uh, there were many requirements uh, uh, where features were not available off the shelf uh, using DHIS2 because uh, it came as a kind of an unexpected event and then the country started using DHIS2 for different use cases and then there were many requirements coming for vaccination certificates to be generated or travel passes to be generated from the system if DHIS2 was being used as the system for uh, uh, data collection. Uh, so there were many custom applications developed during the course of last year. Uh, some examples which you see on the screen. Uh, so this is the vaccination certificate app which was generated for Vanatu. Uh, there you uh, could generate the vaccination report and the certificate right at the point of data entry and provide it to the uh the beneficiary based on the vaccinations that the beneficiary had taken uh so this was uh, the second example is from his western central africa group where they created this uh, travel pass uh, which was required for the the beneficiaries to travel across the country and since they're using dhs2 as their uh, uh, main vaccine covid vaccination system so they generated a custom app to generate these uh, certificates uh, and travel passes uh, through the dhs2 system uh, then there were also um, work being done on uh, establishing these covid19 relationships network model so there again uh, there were custom apps developed using the uh our software where you could create these uh, uh, relationship diagrams between the the confirmed index case and the contacts and then you could be were also able to um, segregate the the status of the contacts as confirmed or suspected uh, so you could create uh, these network diagrams to see uh, how uh, the the pandemic had spread in terms of one person uh one person infecting uh other individuals in in their specific vicinity and then you can also put filters for different uh uh case status uh different org units uh the the distance or the closeness or or betweenness these parameters were already defined and these algorithms are defined so an app was developed using uh our software which was pulling data from dhis2 and was able to create these network models for further uh, COVID-19 uh, analysis. Uh, then here Sri Lanka worked on a COVID-19 relationships app where they were able to plot the, the uh, these diagrams based on uh, the uh, registrations that happened in the COVID-19 case surveillance program, the confirmed cases and the, the contacts which were registered uh, during the, the surveillance exercise. So they could see the blue dots which you see are uh, 
the index cases, which were confirmed cases, and then the person they came in contact with are shown in purple. So the greater the person has uh, the number of relationships with their contacts, then the greater was the size of the circle, and then you could see the uh, you could see each individual case, what the case details were, and then you can also see that specific record in the tracker capture application. So uh, performance was one of the key issues that was identified when uh, DHS2 was uh, pulled into uh, COVID-19 uh, management systems, uh, be it case surveillance, be it vaccination. Uh, given that the scale at which the uh, data volume rose during the pandemic, uh, a lot of focus was given to improving the performance of the system. So uh, version 2.35 and above, uh, saw uh, many changes in terms of the performance where uh, many countries reached out to the core developers at the University of Oslo and reported the performance issues of the systems. And then there were um, many changes being made in terms of how the data is maintained, how the APIs work and how the system responds to the different user inputs which are given uh, by the end user uh, while entering the data. Uh, from 2.37 onwards, uh, a lot of performance-based changes have been uh, done where we have shifted to a sequence-based ID schema, uh, which is also being recommended to be practices, uh, practiced. Wherever you are generating automated IDs from the system, it is recommended that you use uh, the sequence method rather than using the random numbers. So using a sequence number, it was easier for the system to generate these IDs in bulk and then uh, allow users to enter large volume of data. So wherever you have, or if you are currently in a large scale implementation or planning large scale implementations in future, ensure that if you are generating, asking the system to generate automatic IDs for you, then it is all recommended to follow the sequence based ID schema rather than the random uh, ID scheme generation. Um, so uh, a lot of focus was given on uh, getting the feedback from the community when we're using DHS2 for large uh, national COVID vaccine campaigns. So uh, the, the, the server team and the developer team and the interoperable team and the University of Oslo interacted with the different his groups who were implementing uh, DHS2 tracker for COVID vaccine uh, campaigns. And they used to analyze the data in terms of response time uh, uh, what is the volume which is currently hitting the system and how the system is handling uh, the response during the peak times. So we saw that uh, during the peak times when the data entry was in full flow, there were many instances which were facing 25,000 requests per minute for data in data input and which included registering new clients, adding events for vaccinations, generating vaccination certificates, generating reports. So all kinds of things were going on simultaneously. So um, a lot of performance uh, improvements were made. Uh, uh, documentation was done and these documentations were released for the community as best practices to implement and manage large scale implementations. In the course of the academy, we'll discuss these few aspects and then the global documentation which came out as the guidelines for managing large scale implementations, especially for Tracker, those documents will also be shared with you uh, for further uh, reading and for further information and questions. So these are few statistics which were obtained from the field in countries where uh, the tracker program was used in uh, large volume. So these um, uh, case studies are available on the DHS2 website. The links are embedded in the presentation as well. So Bangladesh last year did a measles rubella immunization campaign where they had uh, more than 4 lakh reporting sites and 35 million vaccinations happened. All that data was reported by DHS2. Sri Lanka had uh, the, their entire COVID vaccination program managed through DHIS to tracker where they had pre-imported the, the eligible beneficiaries using the country electoral rolls. And uh, they had a volume of 60,000 uh, vaccinations uh, per day and more than 16 million people were tracked using DHIS. So a lot of learnings came from these implementations and the performance improvements which were done uh, uh, simultaneously, uh, they are now part of the global core uh, releases. So uh, these implementations really helped us to um, understand how uh, DHS2 could be further improved in terms of the performance. Uh, another example was in Rwanda, where they had around 1.5 million 
people registered and more than one lakh people were getting registered uh, per day. Uh, and then they have these set targets where they want to uh, achieve the vaccination coverages by July 2022 was 7 million. So Rwanda has been using DHS to for all their COVID related programs. So case surveillance, contact tracing, as well as vaccination. And everything has been done on large scale. And the learnings that came from these countries have now been implemented for uh, in the global course. So that could be uh, all in all countries, uh, organizations looking for doing large scale implementations can benefit out of the, the developments done. So there are some uh, stability and performance considerations which have been come out of the whole exercise, specifically during the COVID-19 implementations. So if you are planning to use DHIS to tracker for a large scale implementation, ensure that you are on version 2.36 and above. Uh, three seven uh, had the largest impact in terms of the overall performance parameters. So we recommend that you start, if you are already in an implementation, then you should update to 3.6 and above. Uh, suggested is 3.7. Um, and, and if you're beginning new, then you must start with the, the most stable version available at present with the performance enhancements. Um, we, the, uh, the analysis of the, the response times which were done for different type of metadata objects and processes the users were doing using DHS to came across that the user program indicators was taking the maximum response time because they are generated on the fly and to load them on a dashboard page was affecting the overall system performance. Uh, hence, uh, uh, as an immediate recommendation, uh, it was shared that the program indicator should be used as minimum as possible on the dashboards, um, since that was causing performance issues. Uh, the team is working on reviewing the, the way the program indicators uh, function and load, so uh, we'll have uh, further improvements moving forward. Um, Another alternative which was suggested was to uh, aggregate your tracker data on the fly and move it to the data sets to different uh, scripts or uh, the global team also worked on uh, the functionality which they call is tracker to aggregate. So if you wanted to do uh, the analysis then uh, without any performance issues, then in many countries there were uh, mechanisms made to push the data from tracker aggregated into the aggregate data sets so that the analytics could come from the aggregate data sets and that was not hampering the data entry and the other processes which was happening in tracker capture in parallel. So these alternative approaches were also uh, documented and tested in certain countries to see if these uh, models can be used for large scale implementation in countries. Um, then the third recommendation was to limit access to dashboards where you use program indicators to a uh, large number of users and also uh, using that specific dashboard as a landing page because uh, we know that dashboards are the, uh, uh, the first point of entry in the system. So uh, therefore recommendations were made that the landing page dashboard should just have minimum information, which could have your important information, which you want to share with the users, some important contacts, documents, et cetera. But uh, all heavy dashboard should not be part of your landing page. So the first dashboard that you create or which is your by default landing page should be very light in comparison to the other dashboards. Because if simultaneously thousands of users are logging in, then a lot of resources of the servers were going on to loading that specific dashboard which is not needed. Hence, there were recommendations to keep your landing page as light as possible so that people are able to log in uh, very easily and they, the server also doesn't choke up because of the, the, the huge um, load and loading the heavy dashboards which are set up uh, as your first uh, specific landing page. Uh, all the additional fixes which were done for performance, they are already part of uh, the last three supported version, 3.6, 3.7, and 3.8. So the advice from the development team is to stay current. Uh, if you are using 3.4, uh, 3.5 for your big implementations, the recommendation is to immediately upgrade to 3.6, 3.7, 3.8 so that you can get benefits out of the, um, the, the stability and the performance updates that have been made over the last two years, specifically for supporting implementations such as uh, COVID-19. So do uh, uh, focus on upgrading your DHS to instances to these last three supported versions to have the latest support available plus benefiting from the enhancements which have been made. Um, 
so each year uh, the his groups and the university of oslo team have been working on the platform prioritization process uh, we have that process currently ongoing uh, with the university of oslo team where each his group is presenting their top five priorities for each of the dhs2 components platform tracker analytics android interoperability security uh, so these uh, this roadmap prioritization process uh, runs on an annual basis and the requirements uh, taken this year will now contribute to version 3940 and 41 um now earlier we had uh, multiple releases in an year now that has been restricted to two big releases one in april one in october uh, so that uh, there is enough time for development enough time for development between the two releases and a lot of features and bugs could be fixed and introduced during the uh, during the uh, the final release so earlier we used to have three releases per year now that has been reduced to two releases per year uh, so the dhis2 roadmap uh, is now part of the dhis2 website so you can see uh, the roadmap diagrams and you can see what features are planned for which release and then you can plan your upgradations based on the the roadmap uh, uh, timeline which has been designed based on the features uh, which your implementation needs Um, as Pamod mentioned, uh, the tracker support uh, is now available in the existing capture app. Uh, so the basic tracker capture features of creating events, scheduling events, adding data entry, program rules, uh, creating patient summaries, all that has been created uh, uh, is now available in the capture application. The relationships, etc. are not available, which are being added uh, to the new capture application. So at present, you'll have the tracker capture application working as before, but then you also have the capture application where you can uh, use that application as well for your new programs, uh, which are not so complicated, do not need relationships feature and um, these advanced widgets right now, so it could be used. Um, now all the functionalities of tracker capture have been now divided into different themes uh, which are tagged entity centric dashboard cost program analytics improving duplicate record handling batch entry of uh, records uh, in terms of bulk imports um, the performance and improving the ui all these themes have different user stories associated and the work is being done parallelly in all these streams to to ensure that the capture app covers all the functionalities uh, and the design experience which was missing from the old track capture application so the new capture app which is available from 2.38 onwards will uh, will be further developed and all the features will be introduced which are already part of the default tracker capture and the new ones which are being discussed and requirements have come from the ministries of health and the communities and the partner organizations have used the his2 for their data collection and management so these are some screenshots of the new web application. So you could see the person dashboard with the enrollment overview, where you can see uh, one person is part of how many programs. So you could see uh, this person is part of the TB tracker program, the malaria registration program, and uh, has had inactive enrollment in information campaign. And she is not yet part of the child program, any other programs which are there in the system. So in one screenshot, you could see the uh, the patient's involvement in the system in terms of in how many programs the patient is registered. Uh, you could see the notes from all the programs. So wherever there are key set of information available, which could be important for the patients and the clinician to consider when you're enrolling this person into a new program, so, such as allergies to penicillin, mild asthma, um, and any other uh, uh, key information that could be shared across programs. So all the users will have, have access to this information. So you'll have a person dashboard, which gives you an overall picture of the person with respect to the system, not associated to one specific program, but giving you the entire patient history uh, as per all the programs which are available in the system. Then, this is the uh, enrollment dashboards where you can see the data for uh, the patient for all the events that have been created for this specific person, which includes different program stages, which could be of both uh, repeatable, non-repeatable nature. So you can see the lab reporting visits, how many lab events have been carried out for this person, how many have been overdue, how many are scheduled. 
and you can see information for the key parameters captured in each uh, specific uh, event. You can see the errors and the warnings here. So if in your program you have defined warnings for uh, um, for your program in terms of, uh, of data quality and further decision making, then those warnings and errors will be showed on the right hand side in these uh, boxes so that they're clearly visible and demarcated from the regular data entry. Um, and then you can also see your indicator widget. So the key indicators that you have defined for specific patients, you can see that. So this is how the new uh, enrollment screens would look like in the new uh, capture application. Um, duplicate handling is also being uh, um, improved upon with what's available. The new capture app, you'll be able to see the possible duplicates of this person. You could further review this person by going into the, the dashboard of this specific person. And if this is not matching to the existing person, then you can always save that as a new person uh, in the program that you're registering. Um, if uh, Now, if we found that person as a possible duplicate, then you can always, uh, and that was not identified at the time of registration, you can always uh, flag that profile as a possible duplicate. And uh, the once it is marked as a possible duplicate, then this, the user will see uh, a, a flag on the top that this can be a possible duplicate and they should be checked. And if this is not found as a duplicate, then this can be marked as unique. So you can mark your profiles, which you feel may be duplicate profiles, and then you can further classify and make corrections uh, for this specific uh, use case where you have duplicate records identified. Uh, then in terms of the modes of data entry in the current tracker, uh, capture app, you have two timeline and tablet data entry. Uh, in the line listing, in the new capture application, you can also make use of line listing data entry. So you can do the updates one by one for data elements in line format. So that is that is also being introduced. Uh, so you can have, you'll have both the, the, the section wise data entry as you see in the default tracker capture app, but then in the uh, new capture app, you can also see a uh, line list data entry where you can do the entry for one person in one line and fill all record the information available for that specific person and event. Um, in terms of deduplicating the records, uh, uh, there is a lot of work which is going on on improving the, the logics on how to identify duplicate records. Uh, which are being done through either in, including a fuzzy search and matching or matching against a combination of attributes. So uh, my first name, last name, date of birth, mobile number could be searched together to give me a better filtered results. And a background job is also being introduced for finding potential duplicates. And since we saw in the previous slide that you could flag a uh, case as a duplicate case and keep it for review. Uh, the second step here would be the merging of these duplicate records. So um, uh, work is being progress in progress to introduce the merging of duplicate records uh, by uh, where the system would suggest an automatic merge. And then once you confirm that, uh, the identified duplicate records will be merged together into one single record. So the functionality for the deduplication is part of the APS now in 3.7 and 3.8. Uh, the front end team is working on user interface where you can identify these duplicate cases uh, and then uh, potentially move towards the merging exercise uh, in the future releases, which will be uh, upcoming. So I guess that was my uh, last slide. So, uh, so I think the object of the webinar was to introduce to you the basic tracker features which are available and the features which are now part of the Android and uh, are being currently developed based on the feedback that we had received from the, the community, the users through Jira and to different platforms through different his groups. Uh, if there are any specific questions, uh, you could uh, uh, put them on the chat in the Zoom. Uh, if you are already on Slack, then you can put questions there as well. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions right now, then you can please raise your hand uh, and ask specific questions in general for Tracker or in specific to implementations as well. So we have around 30 minutes available. So if there are any questions, please feel free to raise your hand 
and ask those questions. We'll try our best to give uh, apt responses as much as possible. So thank you for your patient listening and uh, uh, we can move ahead with a quick Q&A session before we close uh, the first webinar. Thank you. I guess it's it may be a bit overwhelming uh, for the first day uh, for some of you if you're not too familiar with the uh, tracker, but uh, I assure you like uh, we'll be going very slowly in the upcoming days uh, explaining you the basics uh, on, on tracker and uh, I mean how are we actually going to use uh, the different uh, tools available with the DHS tracker component so uh, um, I mean, I, we, we sincerely hope by the end of uh, this academy, um, you'll, you'll get a better idea about uh, how to use the tracker for your routine work. Any questions you have, please feel free to ask. Yeah, yes, hello. Can you hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Ms. Pramod, for giving me this opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, my name is Amin Amichamsi from Comoros, uh, but actually I haven't implemented DHS 2 yet, but I've been studying the fundamentals and I'm looking forward to, to expand my knowledge on DHS 2. However, I have some two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, I've been seeing, I've been studying like, uh, can also DHS to support on iPhone? It's only uh, on Android app. That's my first question. Uh, secondly, I think it was uh, his India. Uh, he has mentioned that there is a backup of the data. I mean, uh, the data captured on Android app will be stored in a local database. So I'm asking what format could it be? 
either CSV or DHS or any format. And if it's in a DHS2 format, how can we transform it into any other format? For instance, I'm a data scientist and I normally use uh, Python and R. Can I also, at this basis sometimes, can I also transform the DHS database format to one of those formats? Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for those questions. So uh, uh, about the first question regarding uh, iPhone. So uh, uh, it's like this. So at the moment, the native uh, Android uh, native tracker capture application on mobile is on Android. That is uh, mainly because like uh, we see a lot of uh, Android based implementations um, in most of the countries at, at field level because it's mostly a capture application. The primary focus of uh, having this mobile application is the data capture. So, but uh, having said that, we see a lot of uh, requests coming um, uh, from many countries, especially at the kind of, uh, uh, I mean, higher levels uh, for the data managers, administrators, uh, and, and, and technical experts uh, that they need to kind of visualize data mostly on um, um, Apple devices. So right now uh, we don't have a native approach, but then again, um, uh, one, one approach is that uh, DHIS to the web version is now more and more compliant on mobile devices to be used. So for example, you can actually log in to the DHS2 web instance uh, using your mobile. Even if you have a, a Apple device, you can just use a uh, internet browser and log in. And uh, there are a lot of like, I mean, like this uh, weaving of dashboards and sometimes even data entry is possible using that. So that's a kind of a tentative approach. But of course, uh, this has been really considered uh, and uh, I mean, so many requests uh, we have received uh, with regard to this. So probably, uh, I mean, sometime down the line, there is a chance that they might consider having a, uh, but, but of course, as of now, we don't actually have a separate uh, uh, application for that. So do you want to add something for that or? Uh, no, problem. that's about it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, for the second uh, question, okay, right. I think uh, if I understood you uh, clearly, you your question is about uh, the local database uh, on an android device right so if that's the case uh, or, or, or i mean I'm, I'm if i'm understanding correctly so if that's the case then of course yes i mean temporary with this android application we have a local database uh, 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 which we are using but then uh, a feasible approach if in case if you want to kind of uh, take the data out, I suggest would be to synchronize and try to get it from the, uh, uh, from the, you know, like the central DHS2 instance itself, because then there you will have uh, so many different methods of uh, pulling the data out using the web API and so many other technologies. Uh, but like trying to get that data directly from Android device may not be the best of the ideas. That's, that's my feeling. Uh, if I understood your question correctly. Uh, is that what you wanted to know, like uh, uh, to, to take data directly out from the uh, the local database of Android device? Is that so? Yes, that was my question. Thank you. Uh, yes, but I think a better approach where you have, we will have more flexibility is to kind of synchronize data and take it out uh, when it is in the DHS2 central instance. Uh, Saurabh, okay, you thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, all right, okay. Uh, from Arsalan, there's a question I, uh, on use case scenario, can we manage a healthcare practitioner assigned to a patient? Right, so uh, if I understand it clearly, I mean, uh, okay, uh, I think I'm familiar with this use case because I kind of closely work with uh, your team. So. Um, uh, uh, it's like this Arsalan, so the approach should be like, uh, it, it all depends on how we customize and model the tracker. So, uh, for example, like if I, I mean, if I just don't focus on your specific use case and think of a very generic scenario uh, where we have to collect data and we have uh, the patients as well as healthcare practitioners, we can think of customizing DHIS2 uh, for, for that particular generic example, but I think in your case, uh, you have uh, some other requirements where like you, you are having public and private uh, facilities. So there we need to really model the DHIS2 um, in, a, in a way where we can, you know, like uh, make some relation, I mean, some, some analysis even based on the uh, general practitioners. 
So uh, I don't want to dive deep into that particular use case because it's a, it's a kind of a very special use case uh, which is not too straightforward. But uh, what I want to highlight here is because the tracker data model is so customizable, uh, even though you have DHIS2, the next step that you really have to do is to understand the requirements and customize DHIS2 and adopt the DHIS2 data model to best uh, suit your use case. So this your use case, of course, means collection as well as analysis of data. So uh, this, is, this is kind of like my take home message for this particular question. And maybe like uh, when we are actually going into the content in the next few days when we are doing the academy, we can take one or two examples like this and um, and uh, I mean dive a bit deep. But Arsalan, uh, for your specific uh, use case, I think I can um, I mean discuss with you separately. Are there any more questions? All right, if not, uh, Saurabh, I think uh, we should be able to conclude the session for today. Yeah, Pamak, we can uh, move towards the closing and then look forward to the participation for tomorrow's webinar as well. Right, so uh, thank you very much all of you for attending today's webinar and tomorrow also we have a webinar. Uh, so we are, we'll be discussing mostly about uh, uh, what we are going to do specifically in this uh, in this academy and we will introduce the facilitators and all of you who are attending uh, this uh, webinar and of course uh, and the uh, DHS2 Academy and of course we will also introduce you to the, uh, the, the training environment and how to access the resources as well as uh, the I mean the DHS2 demo instance uh, to do all the practical sessions. So all this will be discussed tomorrow. So it's going to be more hands-on. So looking forward to see you all tomorrow. So thank you so much. Have a good day.